as always, it is a pleasure to be before you once again. If you would, be turning over to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. We know from various passages within the Bible that it is intended to equip man for service for God and to ultimately prepare him for heaven. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we know that scripture comes from the very core of deity. And that same scripture is able and certainly does make man perfect or complete. Is able to furnish us or equip us for everyday life in order to perform good and righteous works. And because of that, it is able to make us good. Now, obviously, we must obey that word. We don't want to take that away from it. But that, nonetheless, is the purpose for scriptures. Now, last week, or excuse me, last month, we discussed a passage from 2 Peter chapter 1. And we talked about how virtue is one way that we make our calling and election sure. I would like to continue that study today by dealing with another word that we commonly use, but I think you'll find is used a little differently within Scripture. So 2 Peter chapter 1, I'd like to read the first few verses of that chapter now. It says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding and great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you, and abound, they make you that ye shall never, or neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and, Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In verse 3 of this passage, we read that by the power of God, we are given what is needed for us to, to live godly lives, to possess this life in godliness. Now, as we pointed out prior, the life contemplated here refers primarily to our spiritual vigor that the soul or our immortal spirit possesses. The godliness here refers to the type of conduct or behavior that we engage in while in the flesh. And that behavior ultimately preserves our life. Thus, it can be said that God provides all of our needs for us specifically those of a spiritual nature. These provisions are offered to all of mankind. Yet, who is able to receive them? Who is able to take full benefit of these blessings? Now, as I said, I would like to further our study. We talked last time about how we need to add faith and we need to add virtue to our faith. At this time, we'll discuss adding knowledge to both of these. 
This is part of the process by which we receive God's promises as contemplated in this passage. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, we're given a glimpse into these, uh, this offering. Again, that those verses whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. They're offered, they're given to us. That by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. Now the ASV 1901 renders that, those last phrases as, in your faith, supply virtue, and in your virtue, basically supply knowledge. The idea of supplying is carried throughout verses 5 through 7. You're expected to supply each of these different terms, each of these different aspects to your life. Now in verse 4, we're told about these exceeding great and precious promises. Promises referenced here are great, exceeding great, because they include such things as forgiveness, salvation. They offer peace and ultimately the eternal home in heaven with God. And because of this, we're able to partake in the divine nature. These promises are precious because they derive from our labor while we strive to live godly lives in the flesh. And for what they mean to our, eternal, our, uh, our immortal spirit. As we strive in this life, we have to face different things. And indeed, if we're faithful, our spirit groans within us. How long do we have to keep bearing under this pressure, under this persecution? Yet when we receive these promises, how much more precious will they be when we have given our lives in total subjection to God? We see this basically in, in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32, dealing there with the prodigal son. He lived in a riotous lifestyle. Yet eventually, he would, have, he would come to himself. He would reason that life was better with my father. Life was better at home. He realized that he had sinned against both God and his father and sought to reconcile himself to them. We ought to obey this example. After all, we know that God has fathered our spirits. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 9. We need to seek to be reconciled with our Creator. For the only thing that is able to separate us from our Heavenly Father is sin. Transgression of His law. Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2. What reconciles us is the gospel and obeying that gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 8 and 9. The sacrifice of Christ the shedding of his precious blood makes this process possible for all of mankind. And that gospel is extended through the teaching of the Bible to hearers that will actually attempt to hear it. Though these things are extended to all of mankind, who though has the right to expect to receive these promises? Does everyone have the right to expect them? Obviously not. Who was this letter written to? It was written to those who had already obtained this like precious faith with us. Thus they're Christians. Thus this book is written to help these people be better Christians. This audience had already heard and obeyed the gospel. They heard and believed of the gospel of Christ. They had repented of their past sins. They had confessed Christ publicly and they had been baptized for the remission of sins. They're in contacting the precious blood of Jesus. Thus we can say that Peter wrote to help these brethren be more faithful. It is through their faithfulness and our faithfulness as well that the Christian is able to share in this divine nature. Though in a limited sense while in the flesh. The Christian, after all, is the only one who has been able to escape the corruption that is found in the world through lust. 
No one else can say that, scripturally speaking. For all who have not obeyed the gospel are living ungodly lives, those who are accountable, that is. One effect that the gospel has on the converted is seen by this simple fact is you're allowed to escape the corruption. We're able to see past the trials and tribulations that are present. We're able to see past the snares of the devil. We're able to do better with our lives. And we're granted this great promise. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18. Yet it's not enough to obey the God, or excuse me, obey the gospel and become a Christian. It is required that we continue in that obedience, that we continue to obey the gospel and growing and moving on from simply being baptized. We must live a faithful life before God, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. For this cause, we must give diligence. Now this term diligence indicates an urgency. There is haste required. We need to hurry. We need to move quickly. Thus the Christian is expected to hasten in their growth, their development, their labor in salvation. Salvation for all of mankind should be viewed as an urgent matter. It's not something that Maybe here today, gone tomorrow. It's not really a big deal, but it is. And as we as a country, as a society, drift farther and farther away from God, the urgency behind teaching this fact becomes more and more important. Because if we can live without God and we can live without the idea of a God existing and therefore a punishment such as hell and our eternal reward such as heaven, Mankind is going to simply do whatever they want. There is no urgency behind feeding our spiritual side. Taking care of it, growing it, allowing it to cultivate, and ultimately rendering obedience to the gospel. In this hastening, the Christian is expected to build upon their faith. Hebrews chapter 11 verses 1 and 6. Faith is the beginning. It's not the end. Faith must always exist in the Christian's life, but it is there to support other aspects of growth. As we discussed last time, virtue is a part of that. Without faith, we cannot please God. Thus, faith is not something that we mentally ascend to. Faith, biblical faith, involves action. It's belief and obedience. And it must be alive, active, and working if it is to be pleasing to God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, that it is a wise thing to build a house upon a rock. After all, look at construction. Look at all of our different buildings that are built upon a concrete foundation. You cannot get any more of a stronger foundation than Jesus Christ and his doctrine. But from there, we are expected to grow. Titus chapter 2, verse 3. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. Now this growth requires our diligent, or to, for us to diligently add or supply, not just virtue, but the topic of our discussion this morning, knowledge. We must add knowledge to our faith. The idea here of the word supply relates to a symphony. As the conductor leads those who are playing their instruments, you have the woodwinds playing their part, and as this conductor moves the symphony, the orchestration along, probably add the, the brass to that, then the uh, percussion, and then the strings. If we've ever witnessed a symphony, that's a gorgeous sound. You have these people who have devoted their talents to playing a particular instrument, and they're good at it. And then when you add them all together, what do you get? A grand symphony. A beautiful sound. 
That's the idea here when, when Peter's saying you need to add or supply virtue to your faith and now knowledge to your faith. We're adding different aspects ultimately to be better instruments for our creator. Now individually these instruments sound fine, but collectively they make a grand arrangement. This is exactly how the Christian is expected to grow. Each of these different aspects, or graces as they're often referred to as, are good by themselves, but they're better when they're put together because they're being used for God on part of the Christian. Putting these into practice make us more useful for God and service to Him. But what is the knowledge discussed at this time? The knowledge used in verse 5. Well, I'd like to point out that there are two Greek words in our text that are rendered knowledge in our English version. The first one is found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. And that word, the Greek word, is epinosis. And it represents a full discernment or a recognition. And it's typically used with respect to God. He, is, he possesses this full recognition. After all, he is omniscient. But it also stands for when a faithful child of God is recognized by God. When we comply with the terms of pardon, when we comply with his terms to remain faithful, we are able to be recognized by God. God then, in that instance, knows us. The ISB has the following to say about it, this epinosis. It is used to denote the full and more perfect knowledge which is possessed in Christ, the conditions of which are humility and love. However, this is not the Greek term which we'll study about this morning. The second term, the term which we do want to study about, is found in verse 5 of our text. And it is simply gnosis. Gnosis. This is the type of knowledge which, we're add, which we are to add to our virtue. The ISB describes it as follows. Knowledge, strictly, is the apprehension by the mind of some fact or truth in accordance with its real nature. In a personal relation, the intellectual act is necessarily conjoined with the element of affection and will. So we have to enjoy or want to talk about it, to want to seek it out, to know more about it. Knowledge is distinguished from opinion by its greater certainty. So we're not talking about opinion. We're talking about something that you can know, that you can trust in. The mind is constituted with the capacity for knowledge and the desire to possess and increase it. The character of knowledge varies with its object. The senses give knowledge of outward appearances. The intellect connects and reasons about these appearances and arrives at general laws or truths. Moral truth is apprehended through the power inherently possessed by man of distinguishing right and wrong in the light of moral principles. Spiritual qualities require for their apprehension and spiritual sympathy. So we have inherently, as humans, the ability to discern right and wrong. And we have the capacity to seek out to know more about such things. And God is expecting us to use that capacity. Furthermore, this term knowledge, as defined by Vine's Dictionary, says primarily a seeking to know, an inquiry, or investigation. In the New Testament, it denotes a knowledge of spiritual truth. Spiritual truth. According to Thayer's Greek-English lexicon, it refers to the knowledge of God such as is offered in the gospel, the knowledge of things which belong to God, and it signifies in general the intelligence and understanding, the general knowledge of the Christian religion, and the deeper and more perfect and enlarged knowledge of this religion, such as belongs to the more advanced, especially of those things lawful and unlawful for Christians. 
Now I would like to consider the perspective that Guy and Woods had on this word. It says, as faith is to supply virtue, virtue is to supply knowledge. Knowledge is to supply self-control. And so through the entire list of graces mentioned, each thus becomes an instrument by which that which flows is to be wrought out and perfected. They're building blocks. Knowledge, or gnosis, is the discrimination indicated in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17, and Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. This knowledge is gained by and grows out of the practice of virtue. So you see how they're connected. Now, taking all this information together, it can be stated that the knowledge which we're considering this morning the knowledge contemplated in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, stems from the continued use of virtue, that is, godly moral living. It is the continued seeking of facts regarding moral and spiritual conduct. When strung together, they provide one with the truth regarding righteous conduct. All Christians, then, are expected to possess this quality of spiritual fact finding then they're expected to retain such facts as they've gained them and then to expand on those facts gained so we need to actively seek and investigate we need to learn we need to know those things and we need to retain them so that we can use them later on that's the idea of knowledge that Peter is talking about in verse 5 of our text why is this type of knowledge important Well, from our text, verses 8 and 9, it says, For if these things be in you, what things? Faith, virtue, knowledge, etc. If these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord, or of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. And hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. God made it in such a way that if we're faithful in every aspect, we will never fall. Knowledge is a part of that. Where do we go wrong? Well, we stumble in one of these areas and we sin. First, we note that it is possible to know things. Some people might quote, well, how do you know that? Well, you can't know anything. Well, you knew enough to say that. How do you know I can't know anything? Well, we're expected to grow in knowledge. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. If we're expected to grow in something, that means we're able to possess that something to have that something and to use that something. We're expected to use knowledge. And by the way, these terms are our Greek word gnosis. We're expected to use gnosis as we gain it. Romans chapter 15, verse 14. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, Filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. So they're putting those things into practice which they've learned. What is the source of this knowledge? Colossians chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's an interesting thing to be attributed to Christ, the eternal word. But he is a source of knowledge. We note that this knowledge is far superior. Philippians chapter 3 verses 7 through 9. 
But what things were gained to me, those I counted for loss, of Christ, loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Worldly knowledge is necessary to possess. You know, I have an older truck. It's 22 years old. I have to possess a working knowledge on how to repair it. Otherwise, it's not going to get me down the roads of life. I have become a major user of YouTube and have for some time because they have very many useful videos on how to fix that one problem with your vehicle that you've never dealt with before. I have people that I can rely on who I can ask, and I do. I can be the world's greatest mechanic, the greatest mechanic this planet has ever seen. But if I do not possess spiritual knowledge as outlined in our text, I will be the greatest mechanic hell will ever contain. We need to know how to function in life. We're not saying you can't know anything in this life. It's necessary. But the spiritual knowledge that we're contemplating this morning is far superior to that knowledge. God is offering this knowledge to us. It is upon us to accept it, to seek it, to put those things into practice. Seeking and obtaining this knowledge, this spiritual knowledge, keeps us from being ignorant. We're all ignorant of something. I don't know why that's always been a term that offend people. You walk into a room, everybody in that room knows something you don't. And you know something they don't. It's not a bad thing necessarily to be ignorant of certain things. It is a bad thing to actively seek being ignorant. But we must not be ignorant of scripture. We must not be ignorant of spiritual matters. The New Testament, as revealed on its pages, is the way we remove our ignorance. Romans chapter 1 verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 8 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13. In each of those verses, I would not have ye ignorant, brethren. You need to learn. You need to expand your knowledge. It is expected of us to get out of our ignorance and to continue to grow in knowledge. And because of this lack of ignorance it can be said that we're able to escape being ashamed before God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. How? Rightly dividing the word of truth. Stemming from all of this, we're, at, we're better able to defend the gospel. Philippians chapter 1, verses 6, verse 7, and verse 17. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15 and 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 5. You think if Timothy was ignorant, he would be able to make full proof of his ministry? Absolutely not. You think a Christian who is making an effort, making full proof of their being a member of the church, you think that they're going to be able to defend what they believe? You think they're going to be able to have a Bible study with folks? Absolutely. When someone asks you a question, are you prepared to answer? Are you prepared to grow in that area if you don't know the answer? If we're not, we should be ashamed of ourselves. And knowing the truth, possessing this knowledge, helps us to avoid counterfeits. There are a lot of folks that try to print money, and they succeed in doing so. I don't have to know how many different counterfeit bills are in circulation. If I know what a legitimate 
form of currency looks like, if it matches what you're offering, you have a legitimate form of currency. I only have to know the one. Once I'm in presence of a counterfeit, I can know if it doesn't look just like what this is, it is counterfeit. If we know enough about the scriptures and someone brings in a false doctrine and tries to perpetuate it, do we know the New Testament well enough to say, you're a false teacher, sit down and shut up? Do we? After all, as we've studied recently, that's one of the jobs of elders, to stop the mouths of such people. It's the job of the elders to help defend the congregation from error. But if we're walking right into it, we're making their jobs much more difficult as members of the Lord's church. Now, one way that this counterfeit comes into our, our view is found in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. That word science is our Greek word gnosis. There are many people who claim that Christians do not like science. In fact, you hate it. Christians are blamed for not believing in science. Well, science simply means knowledge. We just read that. It is in, or un, or incorrect, it is false that the Christian does not believe in science. However, the Christian must not believe in false science. After all, there is science, many scientific principles found within the Bible. There are scientific principles found in the very first chapter of this book, Genesis 1. It is necessary for the Christian to understand aspects of science. We typically refer to that as an aspect of apologetics. Usually when folks claim that Christians don't like science, they're just too afraid of having a civil discussion. They try to make out the Christian to be something that is less smart than the ones talking. You don't have a PhD and you don't like science. Let me educate you about how we came into existence. Do we know enough about truth to be able to stand against those wiles of the devil? When we know the truth, we can defend ourselves against counterfeits, false knowledge, false science, so, so called. Now, continuously seeking this knowledge, seeking these facts, spiritual truths, make us fruitful. Verse 8 of our text. It allows the Christian to further influence those for good, who, those who are outside of the church. Now, ultimately, there are only two options in how we're living. We're either fruitful or barren. Possessing this active inquiry, this investigation of the truth, always trying to seek it out, we're going to be fruitful. However, when we choose to remain ignorant, we become barren. And we're no longer fit for the master's use. We become unfaithful. But rather we're exhorted to be more like Paul. To think on the things that he thought on. Philippians chapter 4 verses 8 and 9. You think about how fruitful he was in proclaiming the gospel to the lost and dying world around him. The battle is fought in the mind. He was able to rein his in. Can the same be said about us? Lacking knowledge ultimately brings about spiritual blindness in ourselves. We're not able to see afar off. We're going to have to squint spiritually to see things. Can this be said about us? I certainly hope not. May it never be stated that we're the forgetful hearer as depicted, depicted in James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. We need to be actively learning and putting those things into practice that we find specifically in the New Testament. Otherwise, we can allow our conscience to become seared and deadened to the truth. 
and the power contained in the Word of God. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. As we've studied, God's standard or pattern for living has been made available to all. It must be our standard of conduct. We saw this when we discussed virtue, which was our moral excellence, how we live. God's pattern must be our pattern. We must actively pursue spiritual facts to arrive at spiritual conclusions, collectively forming the truth. When we add knowledge to our virtue and our faith, it makes us more useful for the cause of Christ. And by the way, once you know something, it doesn't mean you stop. You keep expanding. You add these to your repertoire. You add them to your quiver, as it might be. Adding knowledge is extremely useful. It's beneficial. We understand that. We call it higher education. But when it comes to spiritual matters, it kind of takes back seat. That should never be the case for the Christian. Now, possessing this knowledge, as we said earlier, is a necessary step for the Christian to grow in faith. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 11. Wherefore the rather, brethren... Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, if you possess knowledge, that inquiry, that active investigation for God's truth, you shall never fall. Take all these things together and apply them. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Knowledge is a part of the process by which we make our calling and election sure. God calls us by the gospel. The invitation is always open. In a few moments, we'll offer the invitation if you need to become a Christian. Or if you need to, as a child of God, put away sin to make confession of your error and be forgiven by your Creator. God calls us through the gospel, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And we become elected by our obedience to that gospel. It's been said before that God votes for us, Satan votes against us, but who holds the deciding vote? I do. And you do. That's how we get elected. It's not some mystical process that occurs on the front of the church building and you have some type of religious experience or there's something that was predetermined before you were ever born. It is something that an individual actively does. They seek God, they obey His will for them, and they become a Christian. As these brethren did in the first century to whom this epistle was written originally. Applying these principles, part of which we've studied this morning, makes it to where we are unable to fall. That we will be fruitful for God, useful in His service. Yet, through our own weakness, we sometimes stumble. We allow things of the world to become more important than our outlook, our spiritual journey. And because of that, we sin. And as children of God... We offer the, the second law of pardon as it is coined in Scripture, as we refer to it as such, repentance, confession, and prayer. Yet if you are not a Christian, why not take the step this morning and then be obedient and then remain faithful to become a recipient of those promises, those exceeding great promises that we've studied about this morning. If either of these apply to you, please make it known as together we stand and sing.